All right, we're back. I'm about to jump into Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. Jesus' letter to the church in Philadelphia, modern-day Al-Shahir in western Turkey. But I want to start with a question, and really um, a question that I have a lot I can say about and would love to sit down with any, all of you, all of you I would love to sit down with and talk this through because I feel like it's one of those one of those things um, that are somewhat plaguing, I don't want to say plaguing, like that's a little dramatic, but it is a, is a struggle for the church. Our church and every church, really, every Christian church. And, and here's the question I want to I want to put out there. Is Mission Church a world changer? Don't answer it yet. I mean, you can in your mind, but just let that sit with you a little bit. Let it settle in. Is Mission Church a world changer? And maybe the better question and the follow-up question or the clarifying question is, is Mission Church supposed to be a world changer? Because it raises an important question. What, what is the role of Christ's church, the actual faithful Jesus-loving people, not the political or the religious system, the church, but I'm talking about the actual people who believe in, follow, worship, bought by the blood, sealed by the name of Jesus Christ, his people. What's the role of the Christian church with the world? What What's the relationship? What are we supposed to do here? What's the effect we're supposed to have? And, and I will say many of us have been uh, convinced or at least told that, and, and I hear this a lot with uh, younger a younger generation, junior high through college age, especially um, even into the you know thirties, like you got to be a world changer. This church is a world changer. We're going to change the world. And and on one hand, yes, we want to we want to leave this world to leave a better place than when we got here. That's each of us should do that. We should do that in the living room. We should do that in the kitchen. We should do that at a friend's house. We should do that in the world. Like try to make it a a better place. But that's a different question. That's a different sense of world. That's your world. That's your relationships. That's, that's a sense of leaving blessing in your wake. But is the church, Mission Church and the church in general, a world-changing force? And I'm going to say no. And I'm going to also stand on a conviction that it's not designed to be, and it is far outside of our scope of capability to change the world one of the and here's why um, one of the things we see throughout the book of revelation especially is that there is a, a, a group of people who are sealed by god chosen by god marked by god with his name for his kingdom and they are they are uh christians this is us this is the church and that all through history not at some appointed time in the future yet to come but from the time Jesus arrived uh, and died and resurrected until the time he comes again, in between these two advents, the church is going to be assaulted at every angle by our enemy, the devil, who uses this world. In fact, John says in his first epistle, 1 John, he says, we know that we, the church, we Christians are of God and this whole world is under the control of the evil one. In that sense, it's a fool's errand for us as the church to change that, to say we have to somehow rip the world out of the devil's hands and reclaim it. Um, that's what Jesus did at the cross. That's what he began. That's what he, he implanted and germinated by his blood and, and proved was going to happen by his resurrection, and he calls us into that as we wait on him for that great victory. So, probably went on too long with that whole thing, but as we get into this letter to the church uh, in Philadelphia, I, I want us to, to, to acknowledge that, um, that we are called to, to call out of the world those who are ensnared by it. In that sense, we're changing, we're being used by God to change their world in the way somebody was used by God to change my world and change your world. But this world, this system opposed to God, 
is not for us to change. It's for us to uh, call out against and to call people out of. Let me read for us Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 through 13. Um, Jesus' letter that he's dictating to John, the apostle, to have read to the church in the city of Philadelphia. He says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one will open. I was talking about Jesus. Jesus says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet. And they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Whoo! That's the word of the Lord. Mm. The city of Philadelphia um, was founded and named in 189 BC by King... Um, hold on, I'm probably going to butcher his name... King Eumenes, in honor of his brother, Attalus. Attalus's love and loyalty towards his brother, the king, is, is what caused um, Eumenes to name the city. And Attalus was his successor, so Attalus became king. Attalus was nicknamed Philadelphus of Pergamosa and Attalus Philadelphus. So, literally, the name of the city Philadelphia doesn't mean city of brotherly love. It means the city of a brother's love. It was named because the king's brother was so loving and loyal and good and himself became king. That, that's the history of the name, the city of a brother's love. The city was situated about 75 miles east of the Aegean Sea, east of the modern-day city Izmir, which was the ancient city of Smyrna, which we read about a few weeks ago. Uh, and the, this town, Philadelphia, was one of the great was one of the greatest uh, trade routes in the world, linking Europe to Asia. The city, in a sense, held the key to the door through which a lot of east-west trade and commerce passed. Hmm, interesting. So there's a little history in 17 A.D. Uh, the city of Philadelphia, much like a few of the other cities in that region, were devastated pretty much overnight by a giant earthquake. Um, and as we'll see, it, it went through a lot of transformations. Uh, Philadelphia was given, re was um, relieved of paying tribute to the king, to, to the Caesar, um, because its devastation was so great. And they actually changed the city name for a while. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Lots of interesting history about the city that I think comes to play into Jesus' letter to the church there. But I want us to be I want us to remember, Jesus is not writing a letter to the city of Philadelphia. Jesus is writing a letter, in fact it says, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, to the Christians who are in that city, who have shared in all these experiences, who have the same history, but have this new destiny and this new future because of their faith in Christ. It was not a, a, a powerful church. In fact, we, we see right here in verse 8, look, I know, <laughs> this, is, this is great, I love this. Jesus is saying, look, I know you have but little power. I, I know that, I see that, I get it. Um, the church in this city was not a world changer. It was never going to be. In fact, it was getting pretty pushed around by... Um, the, 
the powerhouse religious system that existed there. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But here's what I want us to see through this letter to the church in Philadelphia, that because of the absolute authority and the grace of Jesus, he gives his faithful church four incredible things. And, and they rattle off really beautifully. And this is what I hope you remember. Here's the point. Jesus, by his authority and his power, because remember, he's the holy one, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens. Because of that, Jesus gives us invitation into his family. Jesus gives us vindication. Jesus gives us preservation. And Jesus gives us transformation. How about that? That's gonna re that's you're gonna love just saying that invitation, vindication, preservation, transformation. <clears throat> Here we go. Invitation. You have been welcomed in. I know your works. I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. The church in this city was not powerful. It wasn't influential. It wasn't politically active, or they weren't changing big policies, every, everything they would have tried to do would have had to have been kind of under the radar and, and quiet because they just weren't given any kind of influence by those who held power in the city. And here's what's beautiful. Jesus never uh, rebukes that. Jesus never tells them to change that. He never says, you know, you need to start being more influential. You need to start being more political. You need to start being more involved. You need to change the city. He never says that. He says, I know, I know that you have but little power, but you have kept my word and you've not denied my name because that's, that's what gives them the welcome. That's what, that's what assures their invitation. Whose name is on the invitation? My name invited by, invited by Jesus, the Holy one, the true one who has the key, who opens and no one shuts and who shuts no one up. That's who invited me. And when you, keep his word. When you believe in Jesus, that invitation is yours. The powerhouse religious system of Philadelphia was the synagogue, was Judaism. And it was not uncommon in that day and in this region um, for the synagogue, for, for the Jewish community, the Jewish religious system, to have become really wrapped up with the social political system of Rome. And we're pretty much bullying the Christian church, working hard to convince them that they were in fact not God's chosen people. They were not his redeemed. They had no share in the kingdom. Look at you. You're, you have such little power. If you were really God's people, don't you think you'd have more influence and, and impact on the people around you and the city would be a lot better? But no, you're not. They would pull out their verses and they would pull out their history and they would pull out their theology to show how Israel is the true people of God and not you who believe in Jesus. And they would discount the, the cross and they would do all their things because they were so well resourced and really backed by Rome in many ways, or at least left alone by Rome. They exerted this bullying, push around posture against the Christian church. Religion does this to us. It always has. And it always will. In fact, um, in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation, uh, and this kind of tips my hand as to how I'm approaching the whole book, that it's not so much like, and then one day a beast comes up out of the sea, and then another day a beast comes up out of the land, and here's who that beast is. No, it's, it's, it's the Lord's way of revealing to John and John's way of trying to John's way of recounting that revelation and vision that this is what goes on all the time. This has been the case. The beast that rises out of the land is this religious system that constantly assaults the church, constantly is against God's anointed, God's chosen people who have put their faith in Jesus. Um, <laughs> Religion, just, that's what religion does. It's a system of works that claims that when, when the works are done correctly, God is then obligated to love us, and he's obligated to redeem us. We gain control. We can say, I've earned this. I deserve this. I can bring my claim of right to God and say, look, I've done the work, and you owe me redemption. You owe me favor. You owe me uh, 
love. But that is not true. Regardless of what you've experienced of religion in that way, and I mean religion in the sense of that, that system that we, that people set up uh, to determine whether or not you're worth God's love and favor and his eternal blessing. I know that many of you ha are coming out of something like that. I know that many of you have that in your history and deeply embedded, sadly, in your heart. And it's really hard to uproot that and get rid of it. So let this word ring true. Jesus is the one who opens and no one shuts and who shuts and no one opens, which means that because you believe in Jesus, not believe in all your successful religious works, but because of his successful work of dying for you and paying for sin and rising from the dead on your behalf to bring victory and new life, he invites you. He does not invite those who trust in their works. He does not invite this, this group who are in the synagogue. Clearly, his label for them indicates that they're on the wrong side. You don't, you don't call somebody a synagogue of Satan uh, as, a, as a loving nickname. <laughs> they're, they're on the wrong side. We do this still today. Uh, were you baptized by immersion? Uh, do you have communion with only unleavened bread? Uh, do you meet on Sunday or do you meet on Saturday? Uh, you got to be an extrovert. You got to be a monk. You, we have all. We we can put in all kinds of religious things to say this is what you do in order to gain the invitation of God, the welcome. But that's not true. You're invited because He loves you and He died for you, and your faith in that, your trust in what Jesus did for you. That's what gets you in. Your invitation is believing that. The invitation is true. It says, if I, if I believe in Jesus, then I'm in. And so I believe in that. And so it's his name that makes the invitation sure. And what he says, I, I set before you an open door. That just means I've, I've welcomed you, church, Christian believers in Jesus. I've, I've opened the door to the kingdom to you. And nobody's going to shut it. I don't care how smart they are. I don't care how established they are. I don't care how morally good they are. Uh, I don't care how eloquent they are. They don't get to shut the door on you. And they don't get to open the door for themselves. You, by faith in Christ, Christian, you have invitation. You have the welcome. You are accepted and beloved. There's a place at God's banquet table with your name on it because you trust in Christ. I have set before you an open door. And I want to tell you right now, let's just do this right now. If you have yet to believe in Jesus and you find yourself trusting in your own morality or your own sense of uh, worth, uh, trying to build it up so you can present it to God, uh, give up on that. Just stop that altogether. Turn from that and trust in the finished work of Jesus. He has set an open door before you to just trust in him and come through, to, to claim his name, his righteousness over you. And to bow yourself before him in worship, said, I trust in you and I believe in you. And by that, by that action, by your trust in him, you're invited. You're in. And no one can tell you otherwise. No one. Not me. Not anybody. Only Jesus has the authority to open the door and shut the door. And he will open the door for those who trust in him. And he shuts the door to those who don't. <laughs> you got invitation. The next thing we have is vindication. In verse 9, it says, Behold, I'll make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. I'll make them come down and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Wow. what a, I mean, that's a, that's a harsh word. Synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews but are not. They lie. It's the only Jesus gets to determine who his chosen people are. The fact is that the, the Hebrew nation... In antiquity, the ancient Jews were God's people, chosen people by covenant, by believing a promise, not by obeying the law, but by believing a promise. So when Jesus comes as the final and ultimate son of promise, Isaac, in, in other words, uh, Abraham's son, 
Isaac, when Jesus fulfills that promise, I will give you a son, and we believe in that, then we are God's people. And so, Christians, believers in Jesus, are the new and fulfilled Israel. And any anybody who's an Israelite or Jewish by faith or by ethnicity says, no, 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 I'm God's chosen people because I have an ethnicity or a history or a belief system of, of, of Hebrew or Judaism. It's just not true. And that's Jesus who says it. It's not me. It's Jesus. He said it's always been by faith in the promise of God, not on the, the success of your works or, um, or religion. <clears throat> he says, I'm going to make them come down. I'm going to make them bow down before you, which I'm telling you, when you've been bullied around by a big, powerful religious system in a town like Philadelphia, and you're this small little church, a little band of Christians, uh, when Jesus himself says, I'm going to make them, they're liars, they're the synagogue of Satan, they're not on the right thing, but they're going to come and they're going to bow down to your feet and they're going to say, we were wrong. We have learned. We have learned because Jesus has set us straight. We have learned that God has loved you and not us. He has loved you by faith and we rejected him by faith and so we don't have his love that's vindication now we're kind of conditioned to think this is a bit selfish and yet our souls long for it <laughs> don't they doesn't that, doesn't that just like oh that would feel really good is that mean is that selfish is that self-righteous of me to long for that it's not see this falls in that great realm of justice and that's why it's desired and it it's delightful to to think about it and it's enjoyed. This isn't gloating. This isn't taunting. This isn't us knocking somebody down and standing over them and saying, ha ha. Mm -mm. That's us standing in humility before God and having our opposers and oppressors come back around and acknowledge they are wrong, which gives God great glory. Now, this is actually, a, a, this little sentence is loaded from Isaiah. I'm going to turn to a couple of verses from Isaiah. Verse 45, verse, uh, chapter 45, verse 14 says, Thus says the Lord, the wealth of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabians, men of stature, shall come over to you and be yours. They shall follow you. They shall come over in chains and bow down to you. They will plead with you, saying, Surely God is in you, and there is no other God besides him. So this is God telling the Israelites uh, through the prophet Isaiah that because of their faith in him, he's going to bring all these other nations who have mocked them and opposed them and oppressed them, you're going to bring them all and they're going to bow down to them and say, you were right, there is no other God but yours. And then in Isaiah uh, 60, verse 14, check this out. Uh, the sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you, and all who despise you shall bow down at your feet. They shall call you the city of the Lord the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Again, all these foreign nations who oppose them are going to come back around to God's chosen people and say, you were wrong. We were really powerful. We pushed you around. We exercised our influence in ways that glorified us and not God. And you were right and we were wrong and we're coming to bow down before you. Now, here's the kicker. In Isaiah, this was talking about all the foreign nations coming and bowing down before Israel. What Jesus, the Holy One, the True One, who alone has the key to David, is telling the church today is that, no, no, no. Now, all those really religious people, like the, the Jews, like Judaism, is going to come and bow down before you, who aren't Jewish and aren't Hebrew, and they're going to utter these words. Because it's about faith in Jesus. That's what sets us apart as the people of God. He's the one who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one can open. <clears throat> Here's what's important for us today in our very triumphalistic culture where all sides want to bring about their own vindication. Uh, critical theorists believe that it's their right to reclaim power from all oppressors. Right-wing religious nut jobs, uh, plenty of those, uh, believe it's their right to usurp whatever government is going on around them, so we can usher in and, and claim what we believe is ours, what they believe is theirs. I don't want to associate myself with that group. But here's what Jesus says, and here's what I want us to hear. In, in our triumphalistic culture, listen. 
Jesus says, I will make them. You don't get to make them. You don't get to make them come down and bow before you. Jesus says, I will make them. He says over and over in these letters to, to the churches, I'm coming soon. And I don't think he's referring to his final coming. I think he's speaking about these interim arrivals where he comes and he judges churches and he takes away lampstands and he brings persecution and he brings um, tribulation upon those who are disobedient and walking in sin. I think that's what he's talking about. I'm going to come and make them bow down to you. And ultimately, of course, when Jesus does arrive again, at his final coming, there will be a great vindication for all of us who trust in Jesus, who walk humbly before our God, who over and over and over take it on the chin from this world, trusting and waiting upon our vindication. So let that ring true. You may feel like you're getting pushed around and pushed lower and lower and lower by this world, but there is a day coming where you will be vindicated because Jesus says, I will make them bow down and they will learn that it is you that I love, not them. They're going to learn that I love you and I loved you. Good news. So church, please entertain no delusions of grandeur that somehow the Christian church is going to rise to a place of prominence and popularity and power in our world. We will always appear to have little power. We follow the Messiah of God Almighty who was crucified. This will be, this is our word. I know you have little, I know that um, you have but little power. So Mission Church, let's just own it. We have, according to this world, little power. But we keep his word. We do not deny his name. He will vindicate us. In fact, Psalm 27, which you read earlier, says in verse 14, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage and wait for the Lord. We got invitation, we got vindication, we got preservation. This is a verse, uh, verse 10. Let me just read this again. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world. Try those who dwell on the earth. This is a verse that's often used to prove some kind of rapture of the church, some escape uh, caught up in the air, and then all this trouble and tribulation comes on the earth, but we get to escape it. And there's all this controversy and argument about, does he pull us out before that? Does he leave us here through it? Uh, and this verse has nothing to do with that. In fact, ironically, it's not ironic. It's intentional. Uh, the word rapture is nowhere found in the book of Revelation. That's not a thing that we're going to read about here, where uh, somehow the church just gets exempt from any suffering. Um, <laughs> in fact, nowhere in Revelation or elsewhere in the Bible are we as Christians promised an exemption from suffering. In fact, quite the opposite is true. It is in times of suffering that we are kept and guarded and preserved by Jesus as his beloved people. In fact, he himself prayed in John 17, says, I do not ask, he's praying to the Father, Jesus is, I do not ask that you take them, his, us, his people, that I don't ask that you take them out of this world, but that you keep them from the evil one, so that when they go through the same sufferings, they are kept, they are guarded, they are not hardened against God that we are not lost. Those who do not believe in Jesus can't, can't make a claim to this promise. See, without his preservation, we are all subject. We're all subject to the evil one. That's why he calls the Philadelphia synagogue a synagogue of Satan. That's why he's done that, because they've let themselves go and they don't believe in Jesus. We're all subject to the evil one if we don't keep his word and believe it. Here's what uh, one commentator, G.K. Beale, says in his writing. It's worth the whole paragraph, so I, I wrote it down here. The purpose of this testing, he says, I will um, keep you from the hour of testing, the hour of trial. The purpose of this testing is a judgment on those who are earth dwellers. And the word literally means um, those who uh, claim as their ultimate home, those who belong in that spot. Earth dwellers, 
which is a technical term in Revelation that refers exclusively to the unsaved, especially idol worshipers. Believers, however, though remaining in the world are and exposed to its physical dangers, will be kept from the spiritual harm of testing, that is, from the negative effects of this judgment, in that they will be kept spiritually safe and even strengthened in their faith, while unbelievers will be further hardened against God by the very same trials. Here, let me let me give us an example. Uh, COVID-19 is a worldwide pandemic. Have you heard of such a thing that if you really believe in Jesus, I'm sure there's some crackpots out there saying this, so maybe this isn't the best illustration, but it's too late. I'm in it. Have you heard people say, like, if you really had faith, then that's what will keep you from the hour of suffering. That if you really believed enough in Jesus, it says that he will keep us from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Well, of course, that's ridiculous. Uh, it's, if God is sovereign and is sovereign over the situation in our world right now with this pandemic, then he is sovereignly allowing believers and unbelievers to suffer the effects of this pandemic. To get sick uh, after getting a vaccine for a little while, to, to feel terrible. To, but here's the beauty of it. The good news is that because we keep his word, because we trust in his unfailing love, he says, when those things happen, and when you are uh, experiencing the same trial that is going on around the world, the effect it will have on you because you keep my word is it will, it will reinforce God's hold on you. It will soften your heart towards the things of God. It will soften your heart towards the love that Jesus has for you and the love that you can have for others. Whereas if you don't keep his word, and if you're not a believer, you will say things like, well, this pandemic is just God's judgment against us, and he's just a judgy God, and he hates us, and he doesn't care at all that I've worked so hard to be holy and pure and good and moral and righteous and better and better. So I, I'm mad at God. Our heart will be hardened by such things, but we are kept, we are preserved, we are guarded, we are... Ah, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful image of what happens in the same situation that those who believe are kept and those who don't believe are tried and are hardened. And their their heart for the Lord is revealed to be in opposition to him. We have preservation in Jesus Christ. We have to, as modern descendants of our Philadelphian church brethren, we have to, Mission Church, we have to get over our debilitating addiction to a trouble-free life following Jesus. There is no promise that the more faithful you are to Jesus, the easier your life is. There is no such thing in the Bible. In fact, what you will find is the more that you seek after the Lord and, and adjust your life accordingly, you will experience more difficulty in this life. It will cost you but he keeps you. He preserves you. You get a richness of blessing and a richness of faith that only comes when we, when we sacrifice like that. Why are you so afraid? Have you no faith? That's what Jesus said to his disciples in the boat after he calmed the storm. They were in a storm. But they interpreted the storm as the end and that because they were with Jesus, there shouldn't be a storm. And Jesus had to get woken up he was asleep because he was confident in his promise. We're going to go to that side. I, didn't, I don't have to tell you that there's going to be a storm. I'm just telling you we're going to get to the side of the other side of the, the lake. But they woke him up convinced like, well, how can there be this horrible, scary storm if we're with you? And he says, what's wrong with you? Don't you have any faith? I'm keeping you in the storm, but you still get to ride the storm. So have no fear. You are going to be preserved. You are kept by the mighty hand of God. Jesus is the one who shuts and no one opens, who opens and no one shuts. Nobody can take you out of his hand. Nobody. And finally, we get transformation. Invitation, vindication, preservation, transformation. Hmm. Listen to this great promise. To the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall never go out of it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God and the new Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven and my own new name. Oh, what a beautiful promise. You see, the city of Philadelphia had undergone a number of name changes through its history. Uh, when it suffered the, the earthquake in 17 AD and 
Emperor Tiberius decided not to charge them tribute. They renamed the city uh, Neo Caesarea, which is like the new city of Caesar. There you go, King. I hope, hope that honors you enough. It was considered part of the Decapolis for a while because of the number of cities around it. It was under another emperor called Flavia or Flavia. I don't know. That sounds like a funny name. Uh, and of course, finally, today, the, the name of the city is Alashahir, which literally means city of might or city of a high place. Yet at it, its essence, it's always been the same city. It's just another city in this world. But here we have you, you Christians in this city that just seems to like Rolodex through a bunch of names. No, you. I'm going to write... I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God, and you shall never go out of it. This is where you belong. I will write on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. You are different from where you live. You are not of them. You are not of that place. I want you, if you've got a writing utensil, go through maybe just this last couple of verses and underline how many times Jesus says, I will. In fact, you could do that through verses 8 through 12, and, and you could use some ink there because he says it a lot. I will, I do this, I will, I will, I will. It's Jesus who transforms us, who gives us this new nature. When you believe in Christ and you hold fast to what you have in him, you do not become a world changer. You become changed. Your whole world changes. And Jesus writes on you a new identity. This is who you are. And you become a sharer in his great name, of his great city, of his great kingdom. That's where you belong. You're not an earth dweller. You're a Jesus kingdom dweller. In John chapter 1, Jesus, the word of God says that to all who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God, born of God. That's what happens to you. You are transformed. You are changed from the inside out. He marks you as his. He doesn't just give you a ticket and say, don't lose this. He changes your whole nature to be a child of God. This is what Jesus does and nobody can undo when you put your faith in him. Do you have little power in your life? Do you feel like you're a person of little power? That mission church is a church with little power. Do you feel like you're getting pushed around and bullied by religion? Are you being told you'll never measure up? You'll never be included? You'll never have what it takes? You'll never do enough? Well, hold fast. Grip the gospel of Jesus. He is the one who gives you invitation, and no one can take it away. No one can deny your entrance. He is the one who gives you vindication, so no one can take away, no one can, can unjustify you. He is the one who gives you preservation so no one can snatch you out of his hands. You are his forever and ever. And he is the one who gives us transformation so we are new. I am new. I am a new person. And that cannot be undone. What he opens, no one shuts. And what he shuts, no one opens. Let me close with, uh, again, a verse from Psalm 27. Before, we, before I pray for us and we switch over and sing our songs, Here's what it says in Psalm 27, verse 6. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Praise his name for what he has done. Lord Jesus, you alone bring us in and keep us and change us by your great name, by your great power, so we trust in you, O Lord, and we wait on you. Would you please guard us from the arrogance and the elitism that comes with thinking that we can somehow change this sin-wrecked world? That's something only you can do. And you can only do it by the power of your blood and by the declaration of your forgiveness one soul at a time. And we thank you, Lord, that you are coming again. And when, when you come, we can experience the fullness of joy and glory in your name. Oh, Lord, I pray for any who are listening who don't yet know you as Savior, who haven't put that faith in you, who are still trying to work their way into your kingdom and earn an invitation by their own religiousness. Give them rest and the assurance 
and, and awaken their hearts to hear you, your voice say, no, just say yes to Jesus and enter in and be transformed. Lord, we, we will keep your word because it gives us life. Thank you so much that you have made us uh, triumphant in you, that we conquer by your conquering love. We pray in your great name. Amen. Amen, everybody. I love you. I hope you have a great Sunday. Get on over to YouTube and sing along with the songs we've got on the playlist and have a wonderful Sunday. See you next time.